Good morning, Melbourne. Good evening, New York. My name is Gil Fosnansky, and I'm here to do a follow-up with Josh, who is in New York. I believe he's on the line. I'm just going to see whether or not he is. Josh, are you there? Oh, there you are. Look, you're sitting, you're sitting in there. Um, it's evening your time, 7 o'clock. Is, is that correct? Oh, excellent. And I, I just realized I was going to do something very quickly here, but that's okay. And you've been working on that Creality 3 3D printer that we spent last week putting together. Is that correct? Just to bring people up to speed. <laughs> Excellent. So before we jump into that, though, uh, I, I, I want to give pe for the people who haven't been involved in our live stream, just to let you know what happened uh, and, and, and bring them, everyone up to speed, as they say, is that uh, Josh and I decide, well, we wanted to actually build a 3D printer. Josh wanted to begin his maker journey and start that, that journey with 3D printing. Josh is a STEM teacher. And uh, my, our plan was that I would be in New York and give him a hand, but unfortunately, due to the lockdown, uh, that didn't happen, so we thought we'd do it online and, and bring all of you along. And we did two uh, different live streams. We actually thought, yeah, look, we'll knock it over in one. It took us a little bit longer because we tried to do this as a real-time tutorial. So the idea was not just to show you the steps and just be like, and you put this in and you're fine, but it was actually a real-time experience where we got stuck and we kind of had to work it out. And one of the great things about this live stream is we were able to get some of you, the viewers, who had some of the experience actually helped us out. And that's what making is all about. It's all about sharing what we know. And I love that process. So we left when we left Josh in New York, he, the printer was up. The printer was printing. I have been in contact with him during this week. And we want to give you guys a rundown and actually explain to you some of the things that uh, were successful, some of the things that were I don't want to say failures because we didn't really have any failures, but learning experiences. And I'm really curious to, to see from Josh what that, that uh, feeling was all about. So Josh, you know, take it away. Tell us, where did you begin after you left us? Oh, we can't hear you. Oh, yeah. I'm getting told we can't hear Josh. Give me one second. Yeah, that's that's weird. So I just got told that we can't hear Josh and that's really important. So let's uh, let me um, kind of work on that at the same time. Oh, let's see if we can do that. Josh, are you still there? No, that's still not going to do it. OK, so let's. Uh, wow, this, this is one of those things where you go, huh, you know what? I thought I had it all worked out. Josh, I'm going to ask you again. Are you around? I am here. Oh, I got you now, son. That's Great. not a problem. Let's go back. Josh, I, everyone can, a few people saying that they can't hear you. Let's see if they can hear you now. So. And you all hear me. Hello, hello. I think uh, the, the feed will just have to work itself right, out, cool. but I'm seeing yeah. your audio here. So let's go back to what we're talking about. And Josh, give us a rundown of what happened after we left you and you had your 3D printer up and running. Yeah, so... Uh, as you remember, we worked in for my time somewhat late into the night, got my printer set up, powered on, um, bed leveled, and got that first print going. Um, and as, as it continued to print, like I remember there was something you said to me, which was like, oh, don't worry about the filament too much. It doesn't have to be on the spool. And the, the very first um, learning experience that I had is that if the filament gets tangled up, it's not going to be able to continue to be fed into right the extruder. On. So what happened was, uh, this is this is my first print. Uh, and I'll show you, because I actually ended up printing it again, because I wanted to see what it looked like. And if you look here, it ended up just started, because it wasn't getting anything. And it was just, when I, when I fixed it, so that it wasn't caught up anymore, anymore um, it just was spitting out spaghetti into the air because it needs it's programmed to do a certain thing at a certain height, and it wasn't able to do that. 
so, so, so Josh, let, so we, let's break it down a bit and, and, and actually explain to, to everyone, because you had that experience, uh, if you want to hold up the piece, I think this is a great example yeah. to, to actually not only discuss what happened with your print experience, but also what, what's that kind of checkered pattern on the inside of, of the print. So yeah. we're going we're gonna to hit two birds with one stone. So first of all, um, as you can see behind me right here, right there, there's a big spool on a printer and it's constantly feeding material in. And these 3D printers are pretty amazing machines, but they are kind of like a dumb robot, which means that once you've actually programmed the design, it's going to keep working along the way. And most printers don't have a, a sensor to work out whether the filament has actually stopped. On more expensive or modified printers, you can actually put a little bit of a switch that if the, if the uh, filament runs out, um, in the case of what Josh experienced, basically the filament was stuck. Even if you had a switch there, it would continue the process because it believed that there was material there. But because the feed had actually stopped, um, it was no longer spitting out, but it was continually doing the motion. So Josh would have actually had an experience where the, uh, the print would be here and the head would be moving around printing the design in this way. But it's, right. you know, it's something that's called air printing. It's, it's kind of a little disturbing when you actually go in and you see this for the very first time. Nothing's wrong except for the fact that the material did not feed, its feed continually feed through. And what that actually left, if you hold that print up again, Josh, and I'm just going to cut to that print yeah. so you guys can see. You is, want a close up on that? Yeah, if you could. Perfect. Yeah. So what you can see right there is you can see the inside. It's kind of like a hatch. Why? Now, that's called infill, and infill is really, really important. If you were to, if Josh was to print this design at full size, uh, and sorry, full infill, you would get a solid piece, which is usually what we're ex we're expecting when we get something that's plastic, and that was used um, a process that was developed in, in the in the 60s called uh, inject molding. Sorry, plastic inject molding, and the idea was you would heat up some plastic just like the 3D printer does, and push that through into a mold, and it would fill that mold under pressure, complete and you would have a plastic part, and it was really solid. But if we were to do that, we would actually run the printer for not, not hours, but probably days and maybe even weeks. So a way to be able to make the prints go faster is that Josh can actually define the infill, and to make sure that it's strong, it'll actually create those hashes. And you can use different designs on the infill, depending on how strong it needs to be, and you can also define it. So Josh, do you remember the infill that you were using on that print? Yeah, I believe it was 20%, which was like the, the kind of default, um, which I've learned, and I'll, I'll go into that later on some of the other things I've sliced. But um, yeah, so I used 20%. And uh, as you were saying, if I may, yep. if I were to turn that up, there would be more filled in here. And even though, because I do have the final one over here, and I'll get to that in a second, even though like, you'd think, oh, well, it's not, it's not solid, so it's probably not strong, but it's actually, it is quite strong. The material is strong, and the way that this lattice work of infill is created, it, it's, it's quite strong. It, it feels that way. Absolutely, and I, th I think that was one of the first um, comments that you made when we were going through some of the, the later prints about how strong you actually realize the print was. It wasn't physically, like there wasn't a large area to it, but it retained a lot of strength. And again, that's one of the benefits uh, when it comes to 3D printing. You, you'd be surprised some of the things that you can print, um, some of them very small, but they retain a lot of strength. And it also depends on, on the material. We're using PLA, uh, just for safety's sake. I love PLA because you can use it in a classroom, you can use it in a, in a locked off room. I know that you're in a small apartment in New York. The last thing I wanna do is create a, uh, or, or recommend some material that's gonna cause toxicity. Uh, um, so, you know, PLA, is may, may not be the strongest material that you can use, but it definitely in this case, you know, that was something that you noticed. Yeah, and, and I've, from our conversations and also from my own independent research, uh, yeah, PLA is probably one of the most common and versatile materials to print from what I can understand. Absolutely. And, you know, so you had that first print, it kind of, it got caught, you learned a lesson. The lesson was really important to make sure the pathway for the machine. I believe that, that first print was on a, some material that they had packed in with the printer. So it wasn't on a spool, right. it wasn't on any mechanism to make sure that uh, the material would flow freely into the printer. But you tried it again right. with some material that you had bought. Yes, sir. I, got, uh, I had bought a, another spool of blue PLA filament from Amazon. 
and I was able to create my little piggy bank. So you can see from the first print to the second print, you, you know, it stopped about here, or I stopped it about here when it was uh, air printing, as as as, uh, as Gil was saying. I like to call it spaghetti, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but okay. yeah. So and, and this is the successful first um, print in T my turn it on to the side so that people know exactly what this is. Oh, oh let's show the top. Oh yeah, so it's a piggy bank, Absolutely. and of course you can't have a piggy bank without some coins in it. So, so you <laughs> you've already put some money in there. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, and that's the interesting thing here, too, because this one, it is it is a hollow piggy bank, but uh, in the walls that create the structure, there's also infill. So, like, it, it's, I, I find it quite fascinating. It's also, it's kind of cute, too. It's got a little smiley face on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I, I, was I was really happy when I saw this come through as my first print. It's, it's, it's very detailed. It's very smooth. Uh, and uh, yeah, I was very happy. It got me excited to, to get my, my next print. It, it's a super cool experience. And I know that uh, once we we actually used a a design that came with the printer, so that it had been pre-sliced, it, it was really a shakedown of uh, the printer to make sure that it would work. And I know that you, you made the comment that you were walking around the house just holding it. And I think you made the comment that you, 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 you stopped at the point that you didn't want to kind of take it to bed and sleep with it in your hand. <laughs> yeah, um, it was... And, and this has happened each kind of each time I've printed something new. Like, I was so happy with it that I was like, yeah, I was just watching TV. I would hold it in my hand. I was just like kind of – I just like the feel of it. It's got this like – it's it's it was very satisfying. And, yeah, I, I, I think I was just very excited that I had done all the steps to create this, and it turned out well, and I was I was happy with it. Yeah, I think I, you know uh, we got a we got a comment from uh, Spirit Junkie that said, "Fantastic, uh, you know, save for more supplies, you know, more success, and, and and get more equipment, you know." So you know, the very first thing is actually promoting you to to be able to invest a little bit more in this hobby, and that was great. I mean, you know, I, you sent me a message, you showed me the the success, um, and I, I think at that point we decided that was enough for the, for the night because it was getting late, but uh, yeah. you know. We continue this throughout the week and and share with people, you know, what what was the next thing? What was the next step in this journey for you? Yeah. So I think uh, you you were talking briefly at the end of our last stream about slicing, and I and I at the time I was like, hang on a second, you can't just download a file and and put it on, you know, send it to your printer and and go print and poof, it's done. Um, so and then of course I was like, oh, that makes sense. Like you can download uh, models from websites like Thingiverse, but you have to tell the printer how you want it oriented. Or maybe it's got a piece hanging in the air. You want to put some supports under it so that it doesn't like have a, another air printing or spaghetti scenario. Or, or worse, that it'll just kind of droop and fall over if it is able to put it there and then it's, uh, it's not able to. Right. Um, I mean, that, that's, that's a big part of it. I know that we really concentrated on assembling the machine and, and making sure that it would run. Uh, but there seems to be kind of three different phases when it comes to 3D printing. One is the design phase, which we haven't actually really discussed. One is a slicing phase. And what that means is taking an object that you've modeled in maybe CAD or, or some sort of computer-aided design software and being able to then give the, the 3D printer instructions on how to put material to create that in the real world. And that's commonly known as slicing. So uh, there was a piece of software that came with the machine. Um, I know that you loaded it up and decided that you'd use something else. Well, yeah. So here's the funny thing. And, and this can serve as both a narrative part, part of our story. It can also serve as uh, some feedback to the manufacturer. Uh, the Creality Slicer actually... Uh, there is no, there is no version of it that runs on Mac, which is the computer that I am running. Right, me too. So my alter my 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 options were you know set up boot camp on my Mac and then have a Windows instance running and run it from there, or download something else. So which I guess which one I did. <laughs> I think that you might try to find a different slicer, and and in fact uh, I'm familiar with what you actually uh, downloaded and used. 
Yeah, so I, I ended up choosing the uh, the Ultimaker Cura program, uh, which the, I'm sure I... The you Ultimaker? Know, the you mean, you mean Ultimaker. this design for this machine behind me right here, which is an incredible experience, but uh, Cura is something yeah. that I actually use quite a bit, and it's quite common. It's a really high-powered piece of, of slicing software, and it does really, really well. And, you know, in a very short period of time, Josh, you were able to get uh, Cura all organized and, and ready and, and, and working. And I was actually really impressed with the fact that Cura had a built-in profile for the Ender 3. Yes. So once I got that downloaded, it was super easy, a lot easier than downloading a, a Windows instance and installing that on my Mac. Uh, yeah, it, it just asked me what printer I was using. And I told it Creality Ender 3. And it, yeah, it, it actually even put the picture uh the Creality and the Ender logo on the, the build plate in the program. So that was like kind of customized in that way, which is what you noticed. Um, Excellent. Excellent. And I think that, you know, one of the th reasons when you asked me to recommend a 3D printer, and I know that you were super keen on like building your own, um, you know, one of the things that, that I have a drawback with some of the machines that I have had here and built over the years is that there aren't any kind of profiles downloadable that, get, that links directly into the machine. Uh, usually I've, I've built things on spec for, for the needs that I need, uh, which means I've got to go in there and really fiddle, really do tests to make sure that I can get a result. But uh, with this Ender 3, which is really geared for, for people entering the 3D printer market, um, you, you, got all, you had a very, very kind of seamless experience getting things up and running. Yes, um, I was, I, even before uh, I, my printer arrived, and, and of course, before we uh, assembled it together on live stream, I had already downloaded a couple of models from Thingiverse, which I was really excited about printing. So mm -hmm. the first one that I, my first uh, model that I sliced in Cura and then was able to print was my uh, Starfleet, uh, the next generation communicator badge, which you can see here. Yep. Um, and with your guidance, of course, I have since printing it, used some uh, sandpaper to smooth it out. My plan is to really turn this into like, uh, you know, a screen accurate uh, prop. And I would like to kind of attach a, a magnet to the back and be able to attach it here on my on my chest, that, you know, for some costuming or just fun. Sure. Um, but yeah, like it, I was super happy with this. Um, and I, it, you know, each, each new print that I've done has gotten me more excited to what like, every time I tell someone what I just did, or like, okay, what's next? And I'm like, huh, <laughs> let me think about it. <laughs> can you hold the badge up to the, to the camera so people can see kind of the detail? Perfect. Yeah, so you can see it's, yeah. It's... And one of the great things about the, the, uh, the 3D printer is you can actually define like all the details. So if you turn it around to the back, is there a hole in there? Oh no, you, you got, so some designs actually have a hole for the pin already placed in and yeah. If you were designing that uh, that piece, you'd be actually uh, be able to put that hole in there and and have that as a uh, as part of the actual creation. So that's one of the, the benefits of three D printing. You can actually put holes and threads in, so you don't have to come up with a with a drill later on and actually bury into it. But uh, just depending on what what happens with that piece, that may be something that you put on the wall or something that you then go into another piece of software and modify so that you can actually get the result without having to do that manual step. Yeah, uh, it's really good that you brought that up because, like, in addition to our conversations and like what I've been doing is like, I if, look, you're you're fantastic for <laughs> for being on call and answering my questions when you can. But like, I've done my own work research and I have watched some um, some other people's you know information about what to do. And right. there was a really fun video. Uh, I haven't yet like done this yet, but what he this guy did was he was creating voice in his print right and he also created a, a piece of code that it created the void but then it paused the print it had the the, the bed stick out yep and then and, and then it paused and then he placed the magnet in and he hit continue and it went back and it just started printing over it so the, the magnet was embedded in the print in like the middle so you couldn't even see it on either side absolutely uh, when I first was introduced to this technology when I was in, uh, in California and I was uh, lucky enough to work on a number of film and television uh, projects 
they, you know, these machines were called rapid prototypers. They weren't even called 3D printers at the time. And one of the things they, they did was they would make hand props, but they were completely light. Um, that's one of the, the amazing things you may experience when you actually pick up a prop or pick up something that's 3D printed. It's extremely light because of the fact that the inner part of it is, has no, no real structure. It only has that infill. So what they would do is they would pause the print and they would actually pour sand in the void so that they would actually seal the print up with sand in there so when an actor picked up something that was supposed to have weight, it actually had weight um, in, in the real world sense. Um, it was kind of funny because there was always a little bit that was left out, so you, you kind of shook it like a little bit like a Zumba stick or, or, a, or a maraca, um, and yeah. you, know, you would see actors walking around kind of driving the sound people crazy. But apart from that, it was a really quick workaround, and I believe they changed that um, from sand and using just... Um, like the little metal sinkers that you use for fishing and just putting some yeah. hot glue. So it was a really simple answer to something um, that they needed to, to work out um, using the equipment. Same idea that they used with, with the magnet. So that's, you know, you'll be getting into G code, which is the language the 3D printers use and learning how to pause things, how to move them around and then restart them again. And that's all doable. So Josh, you made yourself your Star Trek communicator badge. What was the yes, next sir. step for you on your journey? Oh, well, I'm going to, yeah. So that one I'm going to come back to in a second. Or okay. at the end of my, we can do that. This is going to come back. But the next uh, thing that I made, because again, this was, I had a queue of things I wanted to make yep. uh, before even beginning. I made my own, uh, I call it a coronavirus gadget. Okay. You can use it, this is very timely. You can kind of use it like this to push a door open. Yep. Or you can use the hook here to grab a, a handle and pull it open. Okay. And then you can also, it comes with a little cover, so you don't even have to touch the end of it where it's touched the door. That's very, <laughs> very James Bondish. Yes, it's, 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 it's like a spy <laughs> tool against kind of disease. And, and yeah, it's, it's super cool. So have you actually used that? Have you gone out and actually Absolutely. used this? Sure. Okay. It goes in my pocket. Uh, I, I, yeah, it, whenever I go like, on a walk or go to the groceries, I, I bring it with me. Okay. Um, I've also printed, I've, I've printed multiples of these and I've given them to family and friends. Uh, I, I know that my, my mom and dad uh, <laughs> were very thankful for these uh, because it's, it's something that's useful right now. Uh, you know, sometimes in, in, in this journey, what I've found is like there's things that are just like fun yep. and they really like spark my joy, like something like this. And then there's things that are just like, they're very useful to have. And I, something like this. Uh, look, that's great. I mean, one of the things that this whole pandemic has, has really brought out is people's creativity and using the resources they have. And right around the world, makers have been using 3D printers to try and answer some of the needs that came up after the virus hit. And, and you're showing a very practical one already it's it's kind of a great idea i've seen a number of variations of these tools and and the one that you're using you just downloaded off the internet for free correct yes sir i uh, got it off of thingiverse um yeah like there's a lot and they're they're actually selling these so right not i mean maybe not yeah they're selling them made of copper or brass and i'm like hey if this it does the same thing and i don't need to pay someone apart from the cost of the materials uh to make it then why not you know, uh, I think I'm seeing Spirit Junkie is asking if it's strong. Yeah. Um, you know, it does. It, it definitely has a little bit of give. If if you're kind of pulling down, it, it will bend us slightly. Um, I would I might consider turning up the infill to, to reduce that give. Right. Um, but, you know, it, it, it works. Uh, I haven't had it. It certainly hasn't broken. So, I mean, it's doing its job. You know, it, it's so funny. I was about to ask you, how would you kind of make it more rigid? And you answered the question immediately. Like, and that's what I oh, love yeah. as, as being a maker and sharing what I know is that you just prove to me that you actually understand the basic concepts. So you want to make it stronger, make, put more infill. Um, some software, and I believe Cura will do it, will actually allow you to define the areas that you want to put more infill in. So you, you know, if you want to take it to that kind of advanced step, you could put more infill on that kind of neck area, that thin neck area, and keep the rest of yeah. it at, at the level that you want so that you can still print them out really, really quickly. So that, that's fantastic. That, Go, Josh. That, that I'm very 
I mean, it, it would be easy enough for me just to turn off the infill of the whole thing, but I'm curious how to do the thing you just mentioned, which is to increase the infill of a specific section. Absolutely. So that's, that's something that I'm interested in learning. And yes. whether you, you and I go through that or I figure it out on my own, like, that sounds like a lot of fun. So you've been talking that you've been doing some research on your, on your own. Um, share with people kind of what's your process. If, if it, ha it happens because we're in such a different time, time difference, I'm asleep and you run into a problem and, or I might be at work or may not be available. Um, although I must admit, I really do enjoy being able to answer the questions I know you, you, do. you ask. Um, <laughs> what, what's the process? How do you make sure that you understand what's going on? Well, uh, I've connected myself to a couple of different uh, sources. One of them is a Creality Ender 3, specific to my printer, mm -hmm. uh, Facebook group, which, you know, when I was having some issues with um, printing, uh, and I didn't get into this, like, this was my first problem, but I actually had also had a stage where my bed wasn't leveled. Okay. Or it was leveled, but the, the extruder was too close, so it was like, it didn't look like filament was coming out in the first couple layers. So I went to this group and, um, you know, I, I shared my problem and they're like, actually, they, you know, you, you would suggest that I go there, but eventually sharing enough data with you, you were the one who helped me figure this one out. Right. Uh, you're like, yeah, Josh, yeah, Josh, the extruder's too close, too close to the, the bed. You, you got to fix that. Um, <laughs> and I That's did. Okay. And I can't tell you like the, the dramatic uh, improvement in, in my experience with the whole thing. Like when I was too close, like I was getting some, I can't, I don't know what the actual term for it is, but like, it was just kind of like kind of some bubbles and, and, and blobs on the, on the bottom layer. Um, and when I fixed that, it just, it was like, Oh my God, it's so clean now. <laughs> like it felt so good to get that right. So Josh, um, I, I think this is, this is a good, uh, time to actually let's discuss it a little bit let's let's explain what happened and maybe we can share that with other people who might run into the same problem right so uh well everyone saw when you and i or i i did it because you're guiding uh leveled the bed of my ender 3 on the live stream and it appeared fine i, I don't know i don't I, it, i'm not sure if i changed something unintentionally or if it was just literally like this the whole time but uh i had uh, leveled the bed using a piece of paper, right? And you know your direction was like, oh, put it under the put it under the uh, the hot end or the, the extruder, you know, in each corner and also the center, and you should be able to kind of feel it and some resistance when you try to pull the paper from under the the hot end. Right. Um, and I think I took I took that, you know, I, I took that a little bit too literally. So when I was pulling the paper, like I was feeling a pull, but it was it was too much. Sure. So what I have it as now, it's it's a very slight pull. It, yep. It's it's not like it's not gonna create a hole in the paper when I pull pull the paper uh, along the bed. It's it's just a very slight um, uh, resistance. And also, in addition to the Facebook group that I joined, I also found a what um, a YouTube video where a a guy had basically created some G code to auto, not auto level your bed, mm -hmm. but move the extruder around the bed to the different points you'd need to level it at. Just, you know, taking some of the work out of, you know, so I don't have to pull it around. It just moves it right there. And he actually even does it twice. So I, I just checked each corner, checked the center, and then checked each corner again. So um, that was, yeah, that, that's, that. sorry, Josh, I just want to jump in there because what you were explaining yeah. is, is a solution. But uh, what I want to share with people is is what was actually going on with with the, with the printer. So what ended up to, and the way a three D printer works is that uh, you have your print level, and then if my finger is the extruder, you want to make sure the the extruder where it, the material is coming out is the right, same di diameter. Um, so you want a really small gap so that when it's when the first layer is coming out, it's actually uh, pushing down on the print bed. But if you happen to have it too close, what ends up happening is the, the material, it doesn't come out, it doesn't flow evenly, and it causes a thing called back pressure. And the back pressure just kind of fills up the nozzle with a whole lot of liquid material. And sooner or later, if you keep feeding material in, it'll actually start pushing it out. And what I realized when Josh was sh sharing some of the uh, photos with me was the fact that that back pressure was putting a really, really super thin layer. 
So there was material on the bed, but not enough um, to actually come out. And what would actually happen is that after printing that first layer, if the nozzle comes out, all that pressure kind of pushes the material through and causes kind of, instead of having a smooth layer to build upon, you actually end up having yeah. like almost like a blob. It kind of, it will even itself out over time, but that's not really good for the machine and definitely not good for, uh, for the print itself. So in this case, what Josh did was absolutely correct. He was able to, to change that level um, a little bit higher, find that middle ground and allow the material to come in. One of the other things that you mentioned just before, Josh, was that you saw there was kind of like lines on the print. And what ends up happening there is that when more material is pushed out because of that pressure in the nozzle, um, when, the, uh, when the extruder comes out, it's, it's usually around 200 degrees, 210. Um, so what ends up happening is that, that nozzle becomes kind of a little bit like a hot knife. So it actually will cut layers into what uh, the material is that has already been deposited. And that's, look, that's something just out of experience. Um, one of the, uh, Josh actually has an automatic bed leveling system to put onto his Ender 3, the BL Touch. It's, it's a common piece and, and it's, a, it's a great thing. But uh, one of the reasons why we didn't put it on straight away was I wanted to, to be able to explain why it's so important to have the bed level the way it is. And it sounds that like through your, uh, through your research and, and through kind of finding a few tools to be able to do it, you nailed that bed leveling perfectly. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I think I'm equating it to, you're teaching me how to drive manual before you let me drive an automatic. Right, absolutely. Like, you know, it, it's one thing learn, to download. on a manual, you know how to drive, yeah. Sure, it, you know, that's a conversation that we've also had, which was, uh, you know, later on, and, and we're gonna discuss it really soon, that you, you printed something out and then you wanted to go and find a profile to download. And I was kind of a little bit like, yeah, Josh, you know, I'd rather teach you what those settings are uh -huh. in there as opposed to just yeah. downloading a profile. Because if you run into this problem later on with something specific, how do you deal with that if it's not a case, you know, if you don't understand what each step is? So, you know, profiles are great to get kind of the car up and running as you, as to use your analogy, but you know, it's also nice to know what's under the hood. Well, that's a really good segue into the next project right. that I attempted. Um, so I was, you know, posting pictures of my prints on social media and, and people were getting excited and like, that's so cool, Josh. And then my friend who, uh, he's, he's, he's a friend from my D and D group. He was like, you know, Josh, you can go to this website called hero forge and you can create a mini of your, your characters that you're playing with right now. And I said, well, that sounds amazing. Uh, so at first, like first thing I did was like I designed one. Uh, and then uh, my friend Jimmy, he was like, well, are you going to print it? And I'm like, I have to figure it out. I have to like, I have to get the slicing right. Because um, I was also watching at this point, that's where, you know, I came up with this like, oh, I need to download the right profile so that it'll print properly. And, you know, I told this to you and you're like, hey, you know, maybe, maybe you want to, it's probably not going to make a huge difference. But anyway, so my first attempt at printing this little guy uh, is here. He actually has a base, but what happened was I accidentally snapped him off of his base when I was trying to remove some of the supports that got printed. Because as you can see in this model, there's a couple of uh, elements that are in, you know, floating in midair, like his cape here, that had some supports under it. Uh, his staff here had some supports under it. Um, and generally speaking, uh, you know, I was, I was a little bit like, it wasn't as clean as I had been getting on the other prints. And I guess like, I was a little disappointed, but it didn't stop me from continuing to try to work on things. And, and after I showed this to you, you were like, why don't you just, you know, stop fiddling with the, with the, with the profiles and just, you know, trust the program that when you tell it to create supports, it'll create supports in the right places. Um, also, you share with me because this is not, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great printer. I'm really enjoying it, but it's, it's not able to do like really fine detail on small models. And even though this one, you know, to me, it, it looks reasonable size, but it's hard to get really strong details seen, uh, in, in this scale. So that was my first attempt. 
And then I tried it again. I, this one, I, I kind of, for, I, I basically forgot to, to up the scale. You can actually see the difference in the scale of this one and this one it's slightly larger. I think I did this one at 120%. And the second one, I did it just regular 100%. I, I would really love to see you actually do that that uh, design at 300%. I want to see a big one. I mean, let's see. Like, this is 100, so it'd probably be like about this tall. Yeah. It would, yeah it, it, would, it, would, it would look pretty It would look pretty good, I think. It wouldn't be a, a mini anymore. Like, many times, these minis are used for when you're playing a game of Dungeons & Dragons. You put your token on the map. Uh, so it wouldn't be great for that, but it would certainly be fun to have as a really fun, you know, uh, statue. So yeah, I, I think I may try that next. And also, putting it at that scale would make it much easier to put supports in uh, and, and be able to get them out and still retain the detail. Right. So I like that suggestion a lot. Thank you. Well, you know, I think it's a great thing uh, just for experience. I know that one of the conversations we had when you printed up your first one was, the detail didn't come out as cleanly as you were hoping. And I think that's where the suggestion was to print it a little bit bigger. But uh, when I think a little bit bigger, I think 300%, not 100%, like not 20% bigger. No. But you did see the results. And what, one of the things that was yeah. interesting as well is that to print that design was really the first time you used supports. Because if you want to grab your, your little figurine, you can show them the cape area. Um, because it's freestanding, um, there's no material um, for the for the cape to be printed in that way. So if, if you imagine the extruder gets it to that level, it starts trying to print, but because there's nothing there, that that cape should just, that material should just fall to the base. So you actually use right. a thing called called uh, supports, where it, it prints up a support that you can break away and you can clean up and and you actually use that. So when you first saw it, he, he kind of looked a bit like a mess. Yeah, um, I, I'm. it was a lot of spaghetti going on. like. Because what I realize now, uh, this is what you know, you learn from mistakes, is this cape was well supported because it was hanging over the build plate. Right. And the setting that I had had it was uh, only create supports on uh, items that are hanging over the build plate. Right. Now, the, so like this is very good. The staff looks really good because that's hanging over the build plate as well. But there's many other parts of this uh, little miniature that are hanging over uh, air, and it really needed support. So, and you and I talked about this, like, it, I can, I can choose to put on all supports. Sure can. But if I do that, I can do that. Uh, but it can be challenging to remove some of those supports and A, not break the model, because it's somewhat fragile here at the base, or B, uh, get them all off and still retain the detail that we were looking for when we printed it. So, yeah, it's it's a learning process. And I think what I would like to do with this is, one, as you said, make it really big and see what I can do. And, sure. and two, um, like put in some custom supports. Like okay. put supports where I think they should go. Because, uh, I mean, this might be difficult to see, but as you can see, like, he's casting a spell here. This is his elbow, and it, it, it's kind of spaghetti under his elbow yep. here. Yep. Um, it's okay. Like, I, if you weren't looking for it, you wouldn't see it, but I'm a perfectionist, and I like things to be done right. So There are de definitely options, both in Cura and uh, other software. I use a thing called Simplify 3D, which has a really simple uh, system that allows you to define um, and the way that's, that system actually works is you auto put, or you basically get the software to put all the material in and then you pick and choose what you want to remove or where you want to add it. So you can definitely do that. And again, part of that's testing. Um, there are tests you can download to see what, at what degree the overhang is going to fail. And I would strongly suggest you uh, try that out because it's one thing to hear from someone, but it's another thing to actually do it yourself. I was told for a very long time, anything at 45 degrees would not, um, would not hold. And it's like, actually, it's, it's a, a lot sharper. So uh, you can actually, depending on how you design, and when you get into designing, you can actually factor those things in. So uh, if you can design things that don't need support, it makes life a lot easier. A lot easier. Yeah, actually, so, so actually, as it happens, I have two D&D characters. This is one. And I was like, let me go all out. Like, let me make it exactly what I wanted. I actually designed another one. I haven't printed it yet. Actually, okay. I haven't downloaded it yet. 
the cost of money for each time you want to download the QR code. But anyway, oh really? So I another okay. one. And as as I was designing this one, I was like, huh, let me make it so like not as many things are hanging over, you know. And I was like designing it so that it would be successful when I printed it. Excellent, excellent. So Josh, after you created the these characters, did you print anything else this week? Oh yeah, sure I did. Uh, there was a, this was another thing that was kind of in my queue from before okay. I got this printer. This is um, it's called an ear saver. Okay. And again, this is a very useful tool for our current times. Now, the funny thing is, I've experienced this material mm -hmm. as being very rigid and strong, like when it's when it's you know like in the form of a com badge or a piggy bank. These are very solid, but I, I was like, if I print this in PLA, is this going to be solid? Is going to is going to be like this this like uh, this solid thing at the back of my head, and it's not going to bend at all? But actually, the way this was designed, it's it's thin enough that the PLA actually uh, bends. It's flexible, and you know, I'm not going to demonstrate. But what what this would do is these hooks at the top and bottom, your elastic for your mask that you should be wearing in public, go over these hooks, and then it kind of keeps the uh, keeps the, the elastic off of your ears. Excellent. And I've made a couple of these for people who may want them. So I, I want you to hold it back up because the first surface that you held up to the camera was a little rough. Um, and I'm yeah. sure you've seen that yourself. Do you have an idea of what was going on there? I mean, I, I, am I seeing the Superman symbol on one side? You are. It, it actually says uh, super, what does it say? Superhero mask here. Okay. Okay. And, so and I, there's some ridges coming out off the side too. It, it, it looks like it, it's a mix between some detail on the print itself and kind of this rough surface. So I actually, from, from where I was sitting, I thought that that top layer had, had not failed, but it had not extruded properly. But looking at it closer, I realized that they were getting really creative with, uh, with that band and trying to etch in some material and then bringing kind of extruding out some of the lettering. So I, I thank you for bringing that up. Because, but I actually did try this another way. Um, I don't know where I put the other one. Okay. But I, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. I, I made another one of these and, when I, and I tried out the, uh, the setting of ironing. Um, which, okay. which actually, uh, after it prints, it, it doesn't extrude anymore, but it moves the hot end over the top layer that, of the print. And the intention is to kind of smooth it out a little bit. Yeah. Now, I, I did do that. I did another one of these like that um, to mixed results. It, it did kind of smooth things out, but you could no longer read these words. Uh, right, because, right. You know, so yeah, uh, this is the kind. I mean, this this works. This is a functional piece, uh, but it is not. I would say it's not optimized because you, as you pointed out, there is a little bit of kind of build up there. I'm not. I'm not exactly sure how to fix it. You know what? It's a functional. You're looking at really, right really fine settings for something like that, and uh, you know the fact that you've already looked into ironing, you've looked at, at alternates to be able to work out how, what, what you can do to actually kind of you know, fix up that final result. I know we've been talking about using uh, sandpaper on these prints and, and trying to work out how to, how to paint them so that they don't look like th uh, a 3D printed object. Um, yeah, <laughs> for the first week, you're pretty advanced. Just really quickly, because we are about to run out of time and I want to make sure that there is time for people asking questions, is uh, anything else printed or? Yeah, I have one last thing. And Please this brings it. the whole thing together. This okay. the whole thing together. Let's because do it. Because I had gotten this advice from you, like to sand. And I was like, you know, I'd really like a sanding block. I'd like something to be able to get fine sanding details. And so I just found a, a sanding block uh, on Thingiverse. And it's really cool. It's got this sharp end on this side for some kind of finer details and a rounded on this side. And this piece, you, you actually have to print these two separately. You slide it in, and then you're, you're kinda, you're, you put your sandpaper here, it goes here. You kind of slide this in and your sandpaper gets locked in. Um, and yeah, I, I used this, this object, which came out quite well, to start sanding my Star Trek com badge 
and it's it's starting to feel nice and smooth. And I would again, I would really like to get this up to like screen worthy prop level of detail. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you'll you'll definitely get there. And I, you know, what what I love about this is we have a conversation, and you go out straight away. You find a, a tool that'll help you get the results you want. You three D print it out. And again, that's kind of the magic of having a three D printer. Uh, I remember when I got my first three D printer. I wanted to make a frame to put all my tools on and I went down to, to a hardware store and it was like 10 bucks for these little L brackets, these little metal L brackets. And I thought to myself, well, hi, hang on a second. You know, I can actually print these out on my 3D printer. They don't have to be strong. It's not about the metal. It's right. about holding it in place while the glue happens. And I went home and I, was, I, did, I created what I needed in, in less than 20 minutes. So, I mean, this, that's an incredibly empowering journey. You can see why these machines have gone into schools and, and in learning institutions, why uh, workplaces are now bringing these machines in because you can do a lot of things in-house. Uh, we are kind of at the cusp of, of being able to incorporate it into uh, to manufacturing, um, what I call small manufacturing. Large companies have printers that, that have been doing this since the 80s. But Josh, I wanna ask you really quickly, um, three things good and bad, three good and three bad things this week that surprised you or things that you were like, now that you're in, at the end of that first week, you're like, ah, oh, I, I didn't realize what that was about. Well, it's funny because almost every kind of, you know, good or bad, every, every, almost every bad thing is followed by a good thing because I always figured it out. Um, you know, the the first big challenge for me, the first big challenge for me was getting the bed leveled properly. Um, and I'm really glad that I went through that because now I know how to do it properly. Great. Um, and, it, and it's, I was so happy that I, had, I finally kind of got that dialed in. And I was like, well, I had the, the, the default uh, bed that came with the Ender 3. And I was like, this is working now. And Gil's like, yeah, you should switch to the glass. And I'm like, but this is working. Why should I switch? This is what I was saying to myself. And I'm finally, I'm like, you know what? Again, we got to try new things. We have to, you know, go into new territory. So I, I popped the, 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 um, the glass bed on and, you know, you were telling me like, oh, you have to put on the, you know, a layer of glue stick to, ha to, to, to have an adhesion with the print and the print bed of the glass. So and I looked at my, my, my Creality uh, tempered glass bed and it actually has, I'm not exactly sure what the material coating it is, but it, it doesn't require you to put any glue stick on it. Right. And I, I had been from my, my first couple of days of using the default bed and having the nozzle too close to the bed and then having to kind of like really work hard to pry these prints off. Um, and then like I printed it on glass properly leveled and it and I just kind of like and just popped right off. I was like, oh, my God, like, <laughs> why did I not use this earlier? Um, right. So, so I, I guess that's a, a, a plus and a, a, a good and a bad at both together. You know, um, I, I want to just really jump in here really quickly. What, what you're experiencing is something that, that, uh, that I learned the hard way, that uh, when the print actually cools off, it shrinks. And because glass isn't yeah. rigid, because it, because it doesn't bend, it doesn't flex, the prints will actually pop straight off. Or if they don't pop off, just a little bit of uh, a kind of um, nudging as such. We'll, we'll get them straight off. Yeah. And I remember I the first time I ever used a printed glass uh, glass print bed was just a normal piece of uh, two mil glass that I took out of a picture frame and cut to size. And uh, I print something, I put it down, I went into the next room and I heard this big crack. And I thought to myself, oh no, I, I've broken the glass. Like the glass has obviously expanded and broken out over the heat. And I walked in and the print had popped off and I was like, oh, okay, you know, and then the next time it happened again, I thought, oh my God, someone's thrown a, you know, a, a ball through the window. And I was like, no, I mean, these, these really loud events. Um, yeah. Then the third time I thought to myself, I'm going to hang around. So what I did was I took the print and I turned it around and as it was cooling off, I could actually see the areas where the print was cooling off and, and popping and literally popping off. And eventually it gets to a point where the weight of the print just kind of pulls it straight off and it makes this kind of ping sound. You don't have that because you don't take the glass plate off your printer, but that's something I would definitely kind of, if you're curious about, I would definitely try. But I think you're also using tempered glass, which is a lot stronger, where I was using kind of just really cheap uh, picture framing glass, which does have a bit of a flex to it. So it became a bit like a drum skin in that situation. <laughs> yeah, man. 
Uh, no, I haven't had that, but it's a very satisfying uh, feeling to not have to use that uh, scraping tool at yeah. all. Just being like, quick, pop, it's done. Um, so that was my first, I guess, series of, well, pluses and minuses. Um, yeah, and there was also a couple of days where I was like, I don't know how to use this cure thing. Uh, right. Like, I don't get it. Like, how do I rotate? Like, it wasn't behaving the way that I thought. Um, like a three, like I'm I'm a gamer as well, and I'm used to being I'm like, oh, you just tilt the stick, and then that changes the camera view, etc. But like Kira, and and I'm sure most some other slices as well. It's like it's not designed for you to like explore the 3D environment. It's designed for you to put a 3D object on a plate and properly slice it. It's not like hey, let's fly around in 3D space. It's like so like I had to get I had to adjust to that. And then, so Josh, you know, are you telling me that you 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 use the slicer as if it was kind of Minecraft? You were exploring what that that yeah. space. You know what? Again, I, I just I'd love to share this because I remember the very first time I built something. I built a futuristic uh, like fighter jet, and the very first thing I did in the slicer was actually change the kind of rotation, and then I was zooming in and out to create the idea of a flyby. And, and doing screen caps. And I remember sharing it to people and they were like, how the hell did you do that? And I was like, oh, with something that I wasn't supposed to do, but you know what? Uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with exploring and seeing what it can actually do for you. Yeah, man, try to break it. I mean, not intentionally try to break it, but like, that's the way the things are tested. You try to break it and you know, you might learn something. Uh, yeah, and I think, you know, the third thing I, I, I talked to you about, like it's, you know, the limits of, of the, of this this printer and knowing the limits and knowing how to, to um, how to work around them, you know, because I, I very much want a nice miniature with high detail that I could start painting uh, and use in live D and D games that I eventually will get back to when things are safe. Um, but yeah, like it's it was really fun learning how. This was like I jumped in the deep end with this one, and I learned a lot from it. And I'm ready to like kind of move on to the, to another one and make it even better. Excellent. I want to jump in here because uh, we are coming up to the, to the last kind of kind of few minutes we have. But a really interesting question came out, and this is actually for you, Josh. So I want you to to take a shot at it, and then I'll add on my uh, my own two cents, as, as they say. But it says, Josh, if, if someone didn't have access to a mentor, would you suggest someone build their own forum or Facebook group with only coaching if they could, like by? Uh, by premise versus hand built. Yeah, I think I I think what I'm I understand the question to be like, if you don't have someone like Gil to help you out <laughs> to build it, um, would I suggest? Yes, I would suggest getting on Facebook groups. Um, YouTube is your friend. Uh, Gil and I were talking before we came on live that like YouTube is basically like the matrix. Like whatever you need to learn how to do, you can go onto YouTube. Um, now. It far be it for me to promote uh, channels other than Gills because it's fantastic here. <laughs> no, but uh, you know, you know, I, I I found a lot of resources on to do exactly what I needed to do, answer the questions that I had, um, and yes, the, the the Facebook group has also been very supportive and helpful. Like I posted like a question, like what do you guys think I should use for a slicer? Or uh, I was interested, and this is the next level kind of thing. I was interested in like, how do I make my own model? What software should I use? And I asked the group and they were just like, hey, here's a couple you can try. So well, I, I think it's possible. Um, this is not, this was a hard build um, and learning all this took some time, but I don't, I don't think it's impossible. It's definitely doable without, a, without an experienced mentor like you. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, look, we're, we're friends and uh, we happen to be in, kind of have similar circles of interest. So, you know, by all means, I, I love uh, what I do professionally is uh, be able to show people the possibilities that weren't there. So this was just an extension of what I do and, and it was absolute pleasure. Normally I don't have people who have, uh, you know, <laughs> access to me 24 seven, but it's been an absolutely fantastic journey and it hasn't been a problem because uh, one of the things that I wanna stress is that Josh had really went out on his own to try and find the answers and then wanted clarification or wanted my take on, on, on some, of the answer, some of the answers that he, he found. And sometimes, you know, it was early this week that uh, when he was making the little uh, D&D character, I was like, try it. Try it and see what happens. Because I, could, I had a fair idea of what, what may happen, 
but the, that process of actually going through it is, is really important. The other point that I wanna make is that the maker community is, is amazing. It's an amazing resource. Um, you can learn only so much by watching YouTube. You can only learn so much by reading a book, but by actually getting, getting involved and, and using your hands and actually going through the process. I know that Josh and I spoke for weeks about 3D printing and 3D printers and alike, but when what I at least experienced from Josh was when he was actually in there doing it, it, it was a completely different uh, experience. It was a complete level up. It was the things we were discussing were falling into place and they were creating new problems and new questions that, that either Josh wanted to answer by himself or he wanted so, a little bit of advice. So I would definitely get involved in Facebook groups. Some groups now have kind of a mentorship program where you can be coupled with someone and actually share the process. And I look, I create, I've got my own lab. Um, I always enjoy working with people way more than I enjoy uh, working by myself. So that's, again, one of the reasons why we decided we get a little bit creative and do these uh, series of live streams because we could do it, the two of us, but we also wanted to share that out. Um, Spirit Junkie actually said to also that, uh, that he, he spelled something wrong. He's like, um, if you couldn't get coaching, do you wanna do pre-made versus hand-built? I'm assuming that's gonna be the models. Um, I would totally suggest you start with the pre-made stuff because that gives you an idea of the process. Once you understand the process, it's a lot easier to go in and start designing. I mean, this is something that Josh hasn't done yet, but um, having uh, taught uh, things like Tinkercad, once you've gone through that process and you understand how the 3D printer works and actually things like undercuts, which may need support, um, putting a hole in to, wow, I, we just lost something. I'm just gonna go to, to Josh. That's not a problem. Yep. That's a problem at my end, but I'm gonna keep talking. Um, by understanding things like um, putting a hole in or even putting threads in, let's see if oh, I'm back, there you go. Um, you're able to actually work out exactly what you, what you need and what will work and what won't work. So you can actually factor that into your design. And you know, it's, it's really incredibly empowering to be able to go in there and actually be able to create what you would like to make. Um, you know, it's great. I always say to all my students, they always say, you show me what you're making. And I go, I make my stuff all the time. You know, I'm in this room, I'm using these printers behind me, I'm talking to people, I'm always developing my work. But what you guys are gonna make, to me, I would never even think about it. And that's really what's, what's exciting because that's a possibility that is just phenomenal. And I'm really looking forward to what Josh is gonna make. And he'll start out with, you know, small little projects and, and keep going. So, you know, it is all about collaboration and that's really the power because if you were sitting in there in a room without a 3D print, just you and a 3D printer, well, you'll make stuff, but it's all about the communication that comes from actually being able to give it to someone and say, hey, have this experience. Josh, where, did, where to now? Where do you go from here? Well, if you're asking what I'm planning on printing next, um, you know, uh, I, I don't have a next, well, that's not true. I do actually have a, a list of objects that I've collected in, in uh, in uh, Thingiverse, um, I'm I'm planning a again a, a mix of objects which are very useful and which are just fun. Um, I've got a 3D printed tie. It's actually made up of like almost like little chain links, like a um, like a chain mail would would be made up of, but yep. tiny little um, pieces. And then I've got uh, I really want to reprint uh, the gas. Uh, my car, like there's a little rubber tether that right. runs from the, the gas tank door to the cap, and mine broke, so I want to make a new one. I have to, although I have to use a different material for that, it's probably TPU. Um, and then there's like a really <laughs> fun, like Nerf gun that I want to make too, although that one requires to need to buy a couple springs. Um, you're going oh, for the top, and there's straight one more, away. Okay. <laughs> You've gone from you know, basic to like super advanced straight away, but that's okay, man. That's part of the journey. TPUs well, are, again, like can I, be a, a really challenging uh, material to print with. Yeah. So, I mean, you look, that's what I did with this. I just jumped in. I learned a lot from it. So, like, I'll jump in and do that, and I'll learn a lot from that. Um, I, it's funny because you said, oh, I don't know what I'm, You said, what are you going to do next? And I was like, I don't know, but, like, it's actually a lot. And there's actually – this is another one that's pretty advanced, like – 
my mother told me about something that NASA announced, which is a device that you can create using 3D printing mm -hmm. and some basic circuitry, which you it, you place it in, around your neck. It's a little electronic device. And if, you get, if your hands get close to your face, it kind of gives you a haptic feedback uh, vibration. And again, and again, this is in service of, like, while you're out, don't touch your face. Don't spread coronavirus. You know what? I, I want to modify that as the maker in me. I want to make an electrical charge. So you go here and it zaps you. So it's like negative <laughs> feedback. Don't touch your face. Don't touch your face. But, uh, you know, I'm sure someone will, will, will modify it that way. Um, look, you know what? I think that, you know, this is great. I, 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 we still have things that we want to do and we want to share and we will definitely do them as live streams. Um, we are going to go through putting on that BL Touch and, and, and share with you kind of that process and talk about how that changed the printing kind of workflow for Josh. And I'm also going to start bringing in some of the things that I'm printing out here to share it with you guys. But uh, you know what? We're coming up to the hour. We wanted to keep this one a little bit tight and, and constrained. So uh, if you're in the chat room, please sing out and say hello. If you like these, uh, these live streams, the best thing you can do is give a thumbs up um, that allows basically YouTube to, to say, hey, people like this and be able to uh, send it out to, uh, to other people. And if you really are interested in making and some of the projects that Josh and I will be doing, as well as the projects that I do by myself, feel free to hit that subscribe button because that also helps me out. Um, you know what? It's been, it's amazing. When you think about where we started and it was kind of like, okay, we're going to jump in. And it was like, I don't understand. How do I put this piece in to one week later? Once you've got the machine, it's like, it's, it's oranges and lemons and it's fantastic. That's the ability that we have as human beings is to learn, adapt and create. And you know what? That's exactly what happened. We learned, Josh, you know, I'm going to use you as an example, but you learned, you adapted when we, we, we couldn't work something out and then we got there and now you're creating things. So it's, it's absolutely fantastic. And I, I personally believe this is exactly what we're here to do. You know, it's great that, you, that everyone's got careers and, and, you know, chasing over things. But if you don't actually add to the world, it's kind of a bit of a shame. I agree. And this is, that's why I think why this gives me so much pleasure. It's like, it's like, hey, I want a thing. Let's make it. Or that doesn't exist. Let's make, let's design it and then make it. Like it, it, it is so fulfilling to me. I really enjoy it. Fantastic, man. Fantastic. You know what? Uh, I want to say thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this process. I know that, you know, you may go, Gil, you're a great mentor and all the rest of it, but it, there needs to be permission both ways to be able to go and, and work on something like this. And it's been absolutely a blast. Uh, you know, I know that, uh, you know, we sit here and you're like, how do you finish that like that? And I'm like, wow, that took me three years to work out. Here you go. Here's, <laughs> let me do it step by step. Just go and do it. Um, yeah. And I'm sure that as yeah. you go along, you'll learn things and be able to share them as well. So, you know, it, it, it's kind of really super cool. So, um, Josh, I wish you, I know it's, it's coming late. It's coming out to about eight o'clock. So I'm going to wish you a really good night. And I'm going to say to everyone else, thank you so much. Again, if you, if you like this, just throw a quick thumbs up um, down there or maybe come, you know, let people know what we're doing. And if we've actually helped you, inspired you to take your own steps, let us know. Let us know that, you, you know, that you're going on this path and share some of that. And you know what? Maybe you can even join Josh and I and talk about your process through as well. Fantastic. Yeah. And, Josh? Uh, and I just want to say, like, again, yeah. reiterate what you said. Like, thank you so much, everyone who's joined us here tonight. Uh, and I'm excited to continue sharing my, my own adventures. It, 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 I'm sure it must be really thrilling for you, Gil, who you, you've got so much experience and just kind of seeing me, like, <laughs> experience this for the first time like enjoy what you you know experienced a, a while ago but like I, I mean i of course i'm so happy to have you on this journey with me thank you man I mean, anytime it's my pleasure and uh, as the great jim durst always says uh you know I, i'm a jack of all trades master of none and that's exactly what i am so i'm happy to share with you what i know uh you know by all means i'm not a, an expert as uh you know 3d printer i don't do it you know i i do it every day but i'm not doing professionally i'm not i'm not going to, to pd training or anything like that but you know by going through that process i've been learning and i'm more than happy to share that okay uh we're gonna leave it there thanks everyone for joining us on this live stream when you're in the chat room uh a big uh shout out to spirit junkie um spirit's been joining us asking us questions and interacting it makes this whole process it's just so much more fun and we look forward to joining you guys real soon again. Um, when, whether you're not, you've got, you've got an evening ahead of you or you're starting your day like I am, I wish you guys a great day. Stay safe and keep making.
We'll see you real soon. Have a good night, guys.